The subject of today's video is Bayes' theorem, a mathematical approach to probability that is central not only to the scientific method, but also to the manner in which we make decisions of any kind that are based on evidence. So who was Bayes and why should we care about his theorem? Thomas Bayes was an English priest who lived in the 18th century, and apart from being a man of the cloth, he was also a brilliant philosopher and mathematician. His great contribution to the field of probability is the theorem that bears his name, and although the theorem is quite easy to understand in its basic form, it has profound implications for the manner in which we weigh evidence and make decisions based upon it. From the very simplest of daily decisions like, should I take my umbrella today, to potentially life-changing decisions like, should I quit smoking? Far from being some obscure mathematical formulation of interest only to academics, Bayes' theorem is applicable to the kinds of decisions we make all the time in our daily lives. Of course, scientists and engineers whose job it is to weigh evidence and make decisions based upon it use Bayes' theorem in one form or another all of the time in the course of their work. For example, how much more likely is a driver wearing a seatbelt to survive a traffic collision at 30 miles per hour? Or how does being over a 40 affect a couple's likelihood of having a child with autism? Or are the differences in the expression levels of this cluster of genes between tumour cells and healthy cells meaningful? If you tried to describe an automobile to someone who's never seen one, the best way would probably be to show them what it does. And similarly, the best way to understand Bayes' theorem is to see it in action. So let's look at an example that affects us all, getting tested for something at your doctor's office. So let's say you're at your doctor's office for your regular checkup, and he says something to you like, time for your routine screening. And let's say for the sake of argument that the disease he wants to test you for affects about 1.5% of the population. In other words, you would expect to find this disease on average in about 1.5 people in every 100. Or 15 in a 1,000 if the concept of the half person makes you uneasy. And let's also assume that the diagnostic test he's going to give you to screen you for the disease is about 80% accurate in patients who have the disease. In other words, the test will be positive, and therefore correct, in 8 out of 10 patients who actually have the disease, and negative, and therefore wrong, in about 2 out of 10 of them. Yeah, sounds pretty good, right? It correctly predicts the presence of the disease in the great majority of sufferers, and only gets it wrong in about 2 out of every 10 of them. So let's imagine that the results of your test come back, and they're positive. Just think about that for a minute. What does this really mean? Given that I've got a positive test result, how likely is it that I really have the disease? That's the big question, right? Before you received the positive test result, we would say your likelihood of having the disease was about 1.5%, or roughly 1 in 70. So given this new evidence in the form of a positive test result, what do you think your likelihood of having the disease is now? So now that you've gotten the positive test result, the doctor probably wants you to come back to his office and discuss the test results, and he might say something like, given that you tested positive, I would estimate the probability of disease to be around 80%. That sounds pretty grim, right? With a predicted likelihood of 80%, you might feel that the odds are pretty much stacked against you. But is the doctor correct? Uh -uh. He's actually way off in his estimate. And this is because he's failed to consider a very important question relating to the test performance. We know that the test is 80% accurate in people who have the disease, but how does it perform in the other 98.5% of the people who do not have the disease? So let's say for the purposes of our hypothetical example that the diagnostic test only returns a positive result in about 4% of people who do not have the disease. Scientists call these false positives, by the way. So just think about that. That's about 96% accurate accuracy in people who don't have the disease. And this is even better than the 80% accuracy that the test shows in people with the disease. So on the surface, it would seem that the performance of this diagnostic test is quite impressive. So by now you're probably thinking, enough with all these facts and numbers, just answer the big question. What does the positive test result really mean for the patient? 
Well, you might be surprised to learn that the probability of having this hypothetical disease given the positive test result is only 23%, or a little less than one chance in four. So what gives? The doctor told you 80%, but the real probability is about 23%. How did the doctor get the interpretation of his own test so wrong? This is exactly the kind of situation for which we need some help from the Reverend Bayes and his famous theorem. At this point you might be surprised to learn that our hypothetical situation isn't hypothetical at all. The numbers we've been using and the scenarios we have described, including the doctor grossly overestimating the level of confidence in the positive test result, were all derived from studies that looked at the performance of one of the most common diagnostic tests for ovarian cancer in women. The test uses the presence of elevated levels of a molecule called CA125 in the blood of women who have ovarian cancer. Scientists and physicians call these elevated levels of CA125 a biomarker for ovarian cancer, which is kind of a technical way of saying that it's a red flag for the disease. The American Cancer Society estimates that the lifetime risk of a woman developing ovarian cancer is about 1 in 72, or roughly 1.5%. In a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that followed 78,000 women who were tested for ovarian cancer using the CA125 test, the test yielded 3,285 false positive results, or about 4%. Of these 3,000 or so women who did not have the disease but still tested positive for it, 1,080 were subjected to unnecessary surgical procedures based upon those test results, of whom 150 suffered complications severe enough to require further hospitalization. It's clear then that the relatively poor predictability of the CA125 test alone used to lead to a lot of wasted time, money and resources in the attempted treatment of women who did not have the disease anyway, to say nothing of the anguish and discomfort of the women themselves in being subjected to these unnecessary medical procedures. Nowadays, by the way, the CA125 test is not used in isolation for these very reasons. So ask yourself this. If you were one of those women who had received a positive test result, would you consent to the surgical procedures? If you were the doctor, would you recommend such procedures based upon the result? Or should either the doctor or the patient just risk doing nothing in spite of a positive result? A major contributing factor to the situation described in the study was undoubtedly the high degree of overconfidence in the CA125 test results on the part of the doctors, which was in turn communicated to their patients. So if you're starting to feel that maybe the CA125 test isn't so good after all, the news gets even worse. The numbers we have been using so far are for late stage ovarian cancer, in which the disease is already relatively advanced. For women with early stage ovarian cancer, when you'd really like to be able to diagnose the disease because the chance of a successful medical intervention is better, the CA125 test is alas only 50% accurate. So at this early stage, a positive test result means that the patient only has about one chance in seven of actually having the disease. And this presents a real problem to the physician. If the test you're using to diagnose a disease only starts to be accurate when the disease has progressed too far to have a good chance of doing anything about it, it's kind of like using falling buildings as an early warning for an earthquake. To follow the earthquake analogy a little further, you want to have some kind of early warning that will afford you a decent chance of getting people to safety before the buildings start falling down. So with ovarian cancer, as with earthquakes, early detection really can save lives. So now that we've seen how important it is to be able to ascribe an appropriate level of confidence to the evidence, let's see how Bayes' theorem can help us. Specifically for our ovarian cancer example, let's see how we got from a 1.5% probability of disease prior to having the positive test result to 23% probability of having the disease given a positive test result. In its most basic form, dealing with what statisticians refer to as discrete probabilities, 
Bayes' theorem is very easy to understand. In our ovarian cancer study, for example, the test for the presence of the disease is considered to be either true or false. You have the disease or you don't, as is the actual presence of the disease. Because Bayes was a mathematician, he presented his theorem in the form of an equation. But there's also a very easy and intuitive path to understanding Bayes' theorem that doesn't require any mathematical expertise at all. So let's start there and see how we get the 23% probability of disease given a positive test result. And then we'll get to Bayes' formula and satisfy ourselves that it basically says exactly the same thing as our intuitive approach and yields the same answers. To understand Bayes' theorem intuitively, let's consider a hypothetical population of 10,000 women who are getting tested for ovarian cancer using the CA125 test. And we'll represent this population of women with this green square. Now we already know that ovarian cancer affects roughly 1.5% of the population, so out of these 10,000 women, we would expect about 150 to actually have the disease. We also know that the CA125 test is about 80% accurate in people with the, the disease. So for those 150 women with the disease, we would expect about 120 positive test results. Remember, these are the true positive results, because in each case the woman being tested actually does have the disease, and so the test is correct in its prediction. If, on the other hand, we consider the remaining population of women who do not have the disease, we would expect about 394 of them to test positive in spite of this, corresponding to the test's 4% rate of false positives. And so out of this total of 10,000 women, we would expect to get about 514 positive test results in total, which is the sum of all the true and false positive tests. So now we're in a position to answer that big question that every patient who gets a positive test will inevitably ask. What is the probability that I have the disease, given that I had a positive test result? The answer seems obvious now. Out of the total of 514 positive test results, about 120 of them will be true positives. So the probability of having the disease, given a positive test result, is 120 over 514, or about 23%. So our intuitive approach to Bayes' theorem gives us the result that we described earlier. The probability of having ovarian cancer given a positive CA125 test is about 23%, or a little less than one chance in four. This is what Bayes' theorem looks like in mathematical form, and when we break it down we'll see that it's really just a more formal way of saying what we described in our intuitive approach. All of the terms in the equation are probabilities. Some are simple probabilities, like PA, which is just the probability of the event A. Others are what mathematicians call conditional probabilities, like this one, which we can read as the probability of B given A. This means the probability of the event B given that A is true, or that A has already occurred. This is where the weighing the evidence aspect of Bayes' theorem comes in. We now have some evidence in the form of A being true, and we can recalculate the probability of B based upon this evidence. For example, the probability that I will actually need my umbrella given that the weather forecast calls for rain, or the probability that I will live to 70 given that I smoke 20 cigarettes a day, or the probability that I will survive a car crash at 30 miles per hour if I'm wearing my seatbelt. And of course, the question we're interested in, the probability that a woman has ovarian cancer given that she has received a positive test result. So now that we've worked through this example using the intuitive approach, let's plug the relevant numbers into Bayes' equation and see what we get. The very first term in the equation is the big question that is probably foremost in the mind of a woman who gets a positive CA125 test result. What is the probability that I actually have ovarian cancer, given my positive test result? This term P positive is the probability of getting any kind of positive test result, true or false. This is equivalent to that purple square that we showed in our intuitive approach, in which we summed the probability of getting a true positive with the probability of getting a false positive to express the probability of getting a positive test result of any kind. 
To get a false positive result, you obviously need to have no disease and get a positive result despite having no disease. So this term is just the product of these two probabilities. Similarly, for true positives, you need to actually have the disease and get a positive result. So let's start plugging in the numbers from our ovarian cancer example and see what we get. We know that the test is 80% accurate in women who actually have the disease, so the probability of a positive test result given the presence of the disease is 0.8. We also know that ovarian cancer affects about 1.5% of women, so the probability of a woman having the disease is 0.015. The probability of a false positive is the probability of no disease, 98.5%, multiplied by the probability of still getting a positive test result, which we know is 4%. The probability of a true positive is the probability of having the disease, 1.5%, multiplied by the probability of getting a positive test result when you have the disease, which we know is 80%. So now we are finally ready to run the numbers and calculate the answer to our big question. If we look carefully at this calculation, we can see that what we're doing is essentially running the same algorithm as we did for our intuitive approach. The equation is expressing the probability of getting a true positive test result divided by the probability of getting any kind of positive test result, true or false. And if we do the math, we get the same 23% probability that we got from our intuitive approach for actually having the disease given a positive test result. So there you have it. We just used Bayes' theorem to weigh some evidence, the positive test result, to determine the likelihood of an outcome that the woman actually has ovarian cancer. But our story wouldn't be complete if we didn't take a few moments to cover in more detail some of the issues that we raised in our ovarian cancer scenario. Now you might remember our physician who grossly overestimated the predictive significance of the positive test results, and you might even be forgiven for thinking we were unnecessarily hard on him. After all, surely the physicians whose job it is to administer these tests and to advise their patients on the results would not be so well informed about this, right? Well actually there have been a bunch of studies on this published in mainstream medical journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine, all of which have shown that in fact the majority of medical students and even experienced physicians do not correctly interpret these test results, generally ascribing more confidence to the results than are actually due. Unless you should think that we're singling out the medical profession for this harsh appraisal, it also turns out that even the scientists who create these tests can fall on their faces when it comes to assessing their accuracy. There was a case of this quite recently in the journal Nature Medicine. A research group had developed a new diagnostic for Alzheimer's disease. The authors claimed 90% accuracy. And it turns out that Alzheimer's only affects about 1% of the population. So when you look carefully at the numbers, it turned out that the test was actually wrong in about 92% of cases. The test did perform marginally better in a more elderly population of patients because in test subjects over 60 years old, Alzheimer's disease actually affects about 5% of the population. But even in this better case, the test was still wrong in about 68% of cases. And let's not forget that this article went through a peer review process to be accepted for publication which essentially means that none of the scientists entrusted with ensuring the validity of the science and the conclusions reported in the article noticed any errors. So clearly knowledge of the statistical principles underlying Bayes' theorem is essential if you're working in a profession like science or medicine in which a core component of your job is the weighing of evidence and the generation of valid conclusions from that evidence. But Bayes' theorem is also important for making informed decisions in our daily lives. For example, is it worth wearing a seatbelt when I drive? Spoiler alert, it really is. Wearing a seatbelt approximately doubles your chances of surviving a serious car crash. Should I quit smoking? Well, mortality rates for smokers are three times higher than for non-smokers, and a smoker is six times more likely to suffer a heart attack. And then of course there are all those less than life-changing decisions that we all have to make 
almost every day of our lives. But perhaps the most practical lesson to come out of our example is that it is worth keeping yourself informed about the issues that underlie these important decisions rather than always relying exclusively on the expertise and judgment of others, especially when it comes to making decisions about your body and your health. We therefore owe a considerable debt of gratitude to this 18th century clergyman whose theorem, as we have seen, has consequences that extend far beyond the academic study of probability and statistics. If you've enjoyed this video and have questions about anything in it or about what we do at Amber Biology, you can find us on the web at amberbiology.com or via email at info at amberbiology.com. Thank you so much for watching and please look out for our future videos.